Hi friends, Lorelai Black here from Blade and Broom, and this week we're going to be talking about where familiar spirits come from. Before we get started, I'd like to just give you a quick reminder that it's November now, um, and this is the first month that I have articles in Evoke publication, so I'd really love for you to check that out. Uh, a good portion of the publication is actually free. You don't have to be a member to see the articles that are there. And I have three that are under that free banner. So um, uh, check that out if you're interested. And then there's one that's under the members only. And it's only $3 a month to become a member. So that's pretty affordable, I think, um, for something that is, I think, going to be this enriching and have this much information for you. So go and take a look and um, just see what you think. Jumping into what we're getting to today, which is where you find familiar spirits and where they come from. So I get asked this question a lot. Um, I get asked a lot about familiar spirits and about working with spirits because it's part of what I'm kind of known for within the world of witchcraft. It's something that I'm very passionate about. So um, I wanted to talk with you guys today about that work and, uh, and getting a little bit more into that work. So when we're talking about where spirits come from, where familiar spirits come from, really there are two questions that are involved. One of those questions is what types of spirits or what are the origins of familiar spirits, um, sort of as a species almost, like what is their makeup? You know, where do we find them? Um, what did they start as? Or have they always been familiar spirits? Um, or what does that even mean? You know, what does familiar spirit even mean? Um, were they humans? Were they something else? Where does that something else come from? Where do we find them? That kind of thing. And then the other question sort of is, how do I get one? <laughs> you know, um, how do I become uh, a person involved in a relationship with a familiar spirit? Um, so we're going to tackle both of those things today. And hopefully give you enough information to get started with that, um, at least in your way of thinking about it. So we're going to tackle that today and talk about um, sort of where they come from, what kind of spirits they are, you know, what, what familiar spirits are, and then also how you can come into relationship with them. So the question of the origins of familiar spirits, like where you find them in the spiritual world, where you find them in the world around you is kind of a tricky one in the sense that um, there's uh, not always a lot of agreement about that among people who work with spirits in general. And also it kind of depends a little bit in terms of the words that you use to describe the spirits. It depends a little bit on your cultural background and the tradition with which you're working. You might just be referring to those spirits as spirits, or you might come to know your familiar spirit as a jinn or as um, a daemon or a demon. Um, your pronunciation of that word may vary, but the word demon actually comes from the Greek word daemon, which just literally meant spirit. The way the word angel came from the word angelos and just meant messenger. Um, it didn't necessarily mean a celestial being sent from God in heaven in the Christian context. It just meant, um, it just meant messenger. In fact, the word angelos was used you know, to refer to human people who delivered messages. Um, a spiritual messenger was also called an angelos um, and could be, a, would be a daemon in that sense. So um, you could have somebody who was both. You could have a spirit who was an angelos. Deities were sometimes referred to with this word daemon. It didn't uh, daemon, um, which we then took to mean demon. And it didn't have this negative context in its original usage. It wasn't until much later when 
the church was trying to um, negate and erase and demonize the gods and the spirits of other religions in order to convert um, the pagans and the polytheists and the people who were practitioners of the folk religions, um, you know, throughout Europe, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout the Middle East, that they, that they demonized the spirits, that they demonized the gods of those peoples. And so what we see a lot of times in the, the lists of demons, in the lists of jinn, in the lists of, um, even in the lists of fairies and the lists of elves in other cultures are actually land spirits that were very well known. We see lists of, um, uh, included in these lists, we see gods and goddesses, we see um, ancestral entities, we see legendary figures and heroes. Um, we see just sort of them grabbing all types of people and saying, all of these people, you know, all of these spiritual guides, all of these spirits that you honor, those are all demons. Those are all um, something else. And so within those cultures, sometimes they get then put under the heading of the fairies or the elves or the jinn or the demons. And cross-culturally, those might actually be referring to very similar types of spirits who are also at the same time very different types of spirits because they might be elemental beings, they might be ancestral beings, they might be heroic people that actually existed or were mixed with legends that had been told and expanded um, but maybe were based on a real person at one point. They might be more mythic characters than that. Um, but then have this sort of egregore energy around them where they expanded um, and are actually something different now in spirit than they were in life, if that makes sense. Um, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to a lot of people. It might not make sense to you yet, but stick with it and it might eventually. Um, so that's where we're seeing a lot of these different names for very similar concepts being used. And a familiar spirit can be any of those. It can come from any of that and others too. It might be, like I said, it might be a very nature-based spirit, a spirit of place, for instance, or it might be um, a tree spirit or an animal type spirit, or it might be a spirit that takes that shape for a while in order to communicate with you or in order to reveal itself to you. So there's a lot of lore around the concept of a particular spirit, one spirit speaking with a witch, but coming to them in the guise of, for instance, a cat on one occasion and um, a human, maybe uh, a young girl on another occasion and then an imp on another occasion, but the witch being fully cognizant that it's the same spirit every time, but they just take three different shapes when they come. So your familiar may appear to you in different guises when you see them. So that's something that can happen. But the understanding is that you would be um, familiar enough with their energy and with the way that they speak to you and that type of thing that like maybe you might be fooled for a minute um, but then you know you'd catch up to that narrative pretty quickly and be like oh yeah I know you you're you know you're Sally or <laughs> whatever whatever name you know your familiar spirit by and then there's the question of how do I come into contact with one of these spirits and there are uh, a couple of different schools of thought about that. So I'm going to start with saying that anciently, um, and, and this seems to hold true in contemporary contexts, um, the spirits tend to aggregate themselves into groups. 
So um, Robin Artisan tends to write about an ecology of spirit, right? So there's this sort of network of spirit that happens. And um, because spirit is known in different places, because spirits are known in different places, you're going to get um, the same spirits popping up in different parts of the world. And even in the same parts of the world, having um, sort of a a host of information about them and a group of spirits around them. And you end up seeing things like kings of the demons and military rankings um, commanding certain amounts of legions of spirits or um, hosts of familiars. And in the Goetia, the Lesser Key of Solomon, you actually see um, lots of different rankings, so, and they always use male terms, which is a little irritating, but um, it was a product of its time, I suppose, and there are a lot of current writings where people are using other terminologies. Um, instead of just king, you'll see king or queen, depending on if the spirit presents in a, in a feminine way instead of a masculine way, and even more recent, you're seeing um, monarch or um, they and them for more gender neutral terms for those spirits that, that don't present um, really in a, in, a, in a binary way. So that's encouraging. Um, but moving on, <laughs> you'll see things like king, um, prince, duke, um, marquis, that type of thing in terms of letting you know sort of where they stand within these rankings. And it also lets you know um, there's actually planetary information that's embedded within all of that to sort of um, clue you in to what planet they're aligned with um, in astrological terms. So that's there. Um, and But then it's not just within that, um, within that realm that we see that. We see that within uh, sort of more Celtic or uh, folkloric interpretations too. So we see it with the fairies, um, with the fae and the she, um, and the way that that fairy tradition, that fairy lore has come down. So we see the king of the fairies and the queen of the fairies. Um, and the, another expression of that is actually embedded within witchcraft, within the witch mother and the witch father. And these high level spirits, these named spirits are the ones who are seen as being sort of the givers of familiars. They're the commanders of these familiars, and they're the ones who say, um, you who's under my, um, who is in my court, or who is in my command, I think you'd be a great fit for that witch over there. Go and help them out. And that's really what's happening. It's not about being bound. Um, you know, nobody's, really like in servitude, no familiar is in servitude to you. Um, they can come and go as they will, and they will leave, you know, your aid. They're not going to stick around and help you if you're not helping them out as well. That's what the deals are all about. That's what the bargaining is about. That's what forming this relationship is about. So um, when you approach a familiar or have a familiar approach you, um, you got to figure out what that relationship is going to be about. And so that's the next step, really. So you understand that there is, um, there is kind of within the ranks of the spirit world, there is, there are ranks, right? So there are some spirits that are these big, very well-known spirits, like, um, you know, they just have this sort of gravity to them, this mass to them. And um, we can approach them if we're interested in working with a type of spirit, uh, maybe a spirit that can get X, Y, or Z job done. Say we're looking for a spirit that can help us um, improve our divination skills or um, one that can help us um, be better at manifesting, um, you know, our, our 
spell work results, for instance, and those are really very different types of skills. So um, we might come to one of those top leaders, the king or the queen, the witch father or the witch mother, whichever one we resonate with better, right? Um, so we might come to one of those top level spirits, one of those top level entities and say, hey, um, I will make you this offering if you could send me somebody to help me with this task. And then um, if they're amenable to the thing that you're offering, in theory, they're going to send somebody your way. Um, another way that that could work is you just start noticing that somebody, you know, a familiar, a spirit is showing up. You start catching the signs that there's somebody on your periphery. So um, that might happen because you're starting to dream about them. That might happen because you're starting to have um, things in your vision. Um, there's any number of things that might happen to let you know about that. Um, and I would be very interested to see some dialogue in the comments about what's been happening for some of you that might be going on with that. I know for me, it's often through dreams. It's through the dreamscape that that happens. And a lot of which work does end up happening that way. Our dreams are very evocative in terms of that type of thing, um, which again, bears out in the folklore. Um, then that that happens for us, right? So um, dreams and through things like waking dreams, like um, meditative space, trance space, that type of working, um, that we come into contact with spirits. In terms of the way the, the bargain or the compact works out, you know, we make one, we often make one or need to make one in order to have a spirit come to us. You know, we approach um, a named spirit um, in order to have that happen. And then we make another one with the actual familiar that comes to us. And we might have multiples of those familiar spirits. We might have many multiples of familiar spirits. You know, just like you can have more than one friend out in the physical world, you can have more than one spiritual friend too. So, you know, you might have lots of familiar spirits over time. And um, those individual compacts are gonna look different from one spirit to the next because they want different things from you. And it might, um, take a little bit of figuring out and finagling to, to figure out what it is that they want. It might take you making offers and seeing if they're interested. Um, and you might have to use some divination to figure that out or, um, or again, sort of go into the dreamscape to figure that out. Um, there are lots of different ways to do that. And we might talk more in another video about how to, in fact, we will, we will definitely talk more in another video about how to communicate with spirits because that is a big topic and deserves its own space. Um, but as a short version of what you might do, you could always use the stone bowl, which I've talked about in a previous video, and I will link that uh, for you. But in short, you could, um, you don't have to build a whole stone bowl for this. You could just draw the symbols on a piece of paper um, and then use a pendulum in order to see sort of what realm or what sphere of type of thing that the spirit might want as an ongoing offering from you in order to, um, be satisfied in order to get something back from you in that relationship. You know, they're providing a service to you. What do you need to give back to them in order to have that reciprocity? And some spirits don't need something so obvious from you on an ongoing basis they might want something that's a little bit more oblique like um, just having you think of them regularly you know um, it's like getting a, a love letter from you on a regular basis you know just having you think of them and smile um, or think of them and say thank you you know i have one spirit that i work with um, that every time my etsy app cha-chings I say thank you and then their name and 
that's what they want. So, um, and it happens regularly enough that like, I'm always saying, thank you, um, with that Etsy cha-ching. And it's, um, like, honestly, at this point, like every time it cha-chings, even my kids, if they're around or my husband, if he's around when it cha-chings, like they say thank you too. So it's like a whole family affair that like, we're all getting in on the thanking that spirit. Um, and it's, you know, quite a lot of energy that ends up getting built up. So you never know what it is that they might want um, or how it's going to end up playing out over time, you know. And it might not always be obvious how they're taking their payment. Like that's a very conscious one. Um, but some spirits, um, and this is something actually that Robin brings up, Robin Artisan brings up in um, the cloven stone workings, some spirits um, actually are interacting with you in dreams and in that dreamscape. And so you may not even be aware of how that relationship is always playing out and how it's working out, but they're getting what they need from you within the world of dreams. And so um, that's another thing to think about. One of the things that I always like to point out to people is that it's not going to be something that you're going to feel skeevy about. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be something um, that you're going to feel um, like you're compromising your morals or your dignity on. Um, the spirit which relationship is one of, uh, it's one of reciprocity. So um, you're going to attract to you and make a deal with a spirit that is going to be in alignment with you and with where you are. So they're not going to ask you for something that is completely out of character with what you feel like you can provide. Um, if somebody does ask you for something, you know, if a spirit does ask you for something and you're like, whoa, <laughs> no, um, then Honestly, they're going to take that as a, as a no and move along. You might have one that's going to like float a concept or see where you stand, um, just to see if you'll cross a boundary, but they're never going to push you or force you into doing something that you are absolutely opposed to doing. They can't, you have free will. You do not ever have to do something that you don't want to do and very much the same for them. You can't force them to do something that they are not going to do, nor should you try. That would be, you know, a highly unethical thing to do. So um, just keep that in mind, I guess. I think that's something that a lot of people are concerned about that like, oh my gosh, if I get involved with spirits and especially, you know, the D word demons, if I, if I interact with them, then, you know, I'm going to be doing bad things and they're going to want me to do bad things. No, I, that's not my experience. Um, and that's not the experience of people that I know that work with them on a very, very regular basis. Are there ones out there who want to mix it up with some, you know, with some um, dubious actions. Sure. Just like there are magical practitioners who want to mix it up with some real dubious actions. So, you know, um, you'll, you'll be able to find spirits who are at your level of ethics. I guess we'll put it in that light, right? So if, um, if you're ready to get involved, um, with some nefarious deeds, um, then there are some spirits out there who will get dirty deeds done dirt cheap, <laughs> right? Sorry, couldn't resist. So it's all about finding that match. Um, and typically wherever you are is where the spirit's going to be too, that are coming to you. Okay, so before I sign off of here, I have some resources for you that I want to point out down in the um, description box down below. So if you are interested in learning more information about this, I'd like to point out some things that I have written and that I have coming out in the next few months. Um, 
I have a revised and expanded edition of my own, which is Key to the Legion, which is a take on the Key of Solomon, the Goetia. So it dives into all of the 72 spirits of the Legion, of the Goetia, um, but it gives a little bit more information um, and definitely takes it from a witchy perspective. So. I'm revising and expanding that right now. Um, expect that to come out in the next couple of months. I am also accepting submissions through my publishing house for The Witch's Key to Goetic Familiars. So if you are a person that's working with Goetic Familiars right now, please consider uh, submitting a piece, whether that's art, ritual, um, an essay, poetry, whatever you got. I would be really interested and having your experiences included in that upcoming work. We're accepting submissions through March. So um, that link for submissions is down below as well. And I'm also working on a piece called The Witch's Key to the Unseen, which is gonna be a broader work just about working with spirits in general, about all kinds of spirits. Like I said, I'm very passionate about this. Right now in my Etsy shop, you can get um, BOS pages related to spirit conjuration and the legion that uh, 72 spirits of the key of solomon so if you're interested in adding those to your book of shadows i have pdfs for you and those links are down below as well and um, if you're interested in the approach that robin artisan takes to this um, from that um, early modern perspective of witchcraft um, his book the cloven stone workings i can recommend it in fact, I wrote a review on it in Evoke Publications this month. So um, my review is linked below and the book where you can find it on Amazon is also linked below. I have lots of resources for you. So I hope you find all of that and along with this episode very helpful in your exploration of this topic. And I will see you guys next Monday at noon. And in the meantime, like, share, subscribe, comment let me know what kinds of things you guys are doing with familiars and i will see you guys next week bye friends <laughs>